Okay, welcome everyone as we start to, um, as our webinar, webinar goes live, we'll wait just a couple moments to have people file in. It sometimes takes a few minutes for all of our attendees to join in. Hello, Barb. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to our participants from the United States as well as around the world. That is definitely one benefit of this year's virtual conference is we have been able to um, have many people attend who have not been able to make our in-person Los Angeles conferences in the past. So we're really pleased about that. All right, we're gonna wait just another minute for some more attendees to come in. As a few more people are arriving, let me also say thank you to everybody just for spending your Saturday with us, uh, or in some places it may be your Sunday, but your, um, your weekend. And for those of you who were with us yesterday, thank you so much. All right. I think we can go ahead and get started. <laughs> Um, I think we can go ahead and get started. I can't say how happy I am for this to be our closing keynote, our end note, our final session with Jun Lei Li um, from Harvard University. We're so pleased that he agreed to be here with us today. And um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce him and then we'll just get right to it. So Jun Lei Li is the Saul Zantz Senior Lecturer in Early Childhood Education at Harvard Graduate School of Education. His research and practice focuses on understanding and supporting the work of helpers, those who serve children and families on the front lines of education and social services. Lee studied and learned from a wide range of developmental settings with low resources, but high quality practices, including orphanages, childcare, classrooms, and community youth programs. He developed the simple interactions approach to help identify what ordinary people do in extraordinarily well with children in everyday moments and made that the basis for promoting positive system change. Again, we're really looking forward to um, hearing from June Lei. And I'm, again, I wanna express my gratitude both to June Lei and to everybody here as we conclude our 31st annual RIE conference with this presentation. Thank you. With that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Michelle. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm, thrill I'm thrilled to be here. Um, and I'm also uh, incredibly intimidated to be here. Um, I understand that all of you have had a good conference and you've had these wonderful speakers uh, that have come along. And uh, then you have me. And one of those things doesn't look like all the other things. And I imagine it's because I'm Chinese. It's really hard to tell a joke on Zoom, isn't it? But um, I always feel odd. Um, and, and, and when Michelle sent me the, 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 the full program a few days ago, and I just, it just struck me like I'm, I'm once again the only uh, 
male person who are speakers. And, and if we were, you know, if all of us are, are, are uh, in person, I would imagine that during the break of the conference, I have the shortest line to the bathrooms. Um, so in fact, that has been uh, very much the same way uh, for most of my work. Um, all of you, um, I think, um, uh, kind of connect together through the term kind of educators. And uh, for our work, um, uh, most of our work is working with helpers, people who help children in whatever capacity at whatever age. And as you can imagine, most of the helpers that we work with from around the world are women. Um, and um, and I, I always, I think, approach these settings with a sense of intimidation, but also with a sense of awe because I, when I go to places um, where people care for children and, and, and often it's in places that are, that are incredibly difficult and with, with very limited resources, um, I just, I admire um, what people do and, 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 and how they do it in kind of the simplest, most ordinary moments. Um, part of our work, um, take us across the United States, as well as China and Canada. And, uh, and the kind of work that I'll be speaking about today uh, comes from the collaboration of many colleagues. Um, and again, many of them um, uh, women. And I just wanted to share upfront how indebted I am um, to all the educators or helpers that we've had the opportunity to learn from. And also at the same time, I'm very much aware that there's hardly anything that I can think of uh, that comes from me that would be considered teaching. Um, I think one thing that I wanted to do is to share my appreciation um, of, the so, of the many, many different ways that helpers and educators care for children and care for communities around the world. And the communities that we have opportunities to work around the world, often in person, um, and often not in the form of, you know, Zoom or something, but in person, sitting around the room, talking about the way they help children. Um, these settings may include, you know, child care centers in some of the child care deserts uh, here in this country, uh, both in urban and in rural communities, or in China, where, um, for the last eight years, we have visited this tiny little village in a rural community that housed foster children with um, moderate to severe disabilities, um, but nevertheless created a beautiful community for them. Some of the places we go, for example, these rural villages in China in the mountains where you, you can see just from the picture kind of the ratio between teachers and students and you can imagine the challenges that they have. But we, when we visit there, we're just awestruck by the kind of relationships that teachers are able to build uh, with students, even in a large classroom like that. And in China and in Canada and the United States, we have worked with those who support young children uh, with high needs. And, and, and just to watch kind of the, the, the the patient and creative ways that these caregivers find a window that is open and, and, and establish a connection with young people. And lastly, um, for the last few years, uh, both in China and in the, the United States and in Canada, uh, we have had opportunities to work with those who work with um, young people who are in foster care or young people who are in residential facilities who have experienced much um, struggles and trauma in their own history and to watch these youth social workers bring healing um, through the way they interact and build relationship with them is also incredibly inspiring. And over time, what we have done is we go out and we observe uh, what these helpers do. We talk with the helpers and we work with the helpers together as a community of practice, a community of people who share in the practice of helping children, helping families, helping communities. 
And throughout these processes, uh, we have learned a few, I think, important lessons that seem to apply uh, across all these different contexts, across age gr groups, uh, across job titles, uh, in terms of how helpers uh, bring the power of human connections to the care and education of children. And there's here that I wanted to share with you a couple of stories uh, from our work, our colleagues' work, and we wanted to just take a little bit of time to just hopefully to have a, a chance to reflect on what is essential um, in what we do day in and day out. The first story I wanted to share comes from a good friend of mine, Kelly Roddenbush. Kelly is a family therapist who works out of Philly, and uh, as part of her service work, um, she goes, um, uh, she takes a mission team to China <coughs> and serve in orphanages and work with children, work with the caregivers in the orphanages, as well as working with the directors and so on. And a few years ago, um, Kelly was in a Chinese orphanage and she was getting ready to do a workshop uh, with um, the orphanage caregivers as well as the orphanage directors and so on. And um, overnight from China, she sent me this really short video. She says, I was just running down the hall trying to get the conference room, trying to get the conference room set up. And then I walked by this room and the children happened to be eating at that time. So I took out my cell phone and I just quickly, you know, took a picture and took a video of what they were doing. And then I ran down the hall. But later on in the evening, as I was going through my phone, I saw this video that was just 10 seconds long, but I, I just thought you'd like to see it. So she sent me this video overnight and I just wanted to share this with you now. So here's an orphanage setting. Um, and we have two caregivers and two uh, very young children. Um, I'm just going to play the video once, right? And uh, it's, it's, again, it's very short. And I know within the EduCare community, uh, you all are very disciplined about observing and noticing. So I'm not going to give you any more prompts just for you to notice and observe uh, however you would like uh, in this kind of tiny little moment. Okay, so I'm gonna do this one more time. Again, it's just about 10 seconds long. And when it's done, um, maybe we can try this. Um, if we can use the chat function of the Zoom, if, if you would just share, you don't have to share an essay, but you, if you would just share one thing that really struck you about that particular uh, uh, moment, then all of us have a chance to read you know, what everyone else is seeing uh, in this particular moment. I'm gonna do this video one more time. Oops, sorry. Here we go. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing of the screen. I'm just gonna open up the chat window so that we can see um, what everyone is saying. I see reciprocity, proximity, the closeness of the four people, eye contact, smiles, talks, and sounds, the attention. Oh, it's coming in so fast. Okay, I'm trying to read them all. The attention of caregivers, caregivers delight. Um, Hannah writes, I noticed the caregiver shrugged her shoulders and smiled, then the baby did. A lot of responsiveness, eye contact connection, trust in the caregiver. When the caregiver lifted her shoulders, the infant copied her and did the same. Both caregivers are focused on the babies, lovely facial affect, people seem engaged, parallel, mutual connection between the two diets. I love how they were sitting on the floor with the children, um, joy in the caregivers. Are the caregivers mirroring each other or using a similar technique? 
real quality time. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for humoring me and, and sharing all, all of that. Now, um, I'm just going to take a wild guess, right? So judging by most of the names, um, I'm guessing that most of you don't speak Chinese, so you don't actually understand like what they're saying. But that doesn't really stop you, right, from being able to see, to notice these details. And, and there's something about caregiving. There's something about these interactions that are universal, right? It touches us even when we go across language, across cultures, and across the settings. And I wanted to share a little bit about why this moment to me is significant. Of course, there, there's these beautiful interactions in the moment, um, but even beyond that, I think I think we, we have to understand kind of the context of the orphanage, right? So this isn't a childcare setting, this isn't a preschool, this isn't a home. Although if I didn't tell you, right, what this place is, it may feel like just a preschool setting. But the orphanage setting from Eastern Europe to Latin America to Asia often are characterized by very limited interactions like the kind that you see, right? Not because people don't want to, not because the children don't want to, not because the grown-ups don't want to, but because orphanages are by design institutionalized, which means that you have many ch children, very few caregivers, and a long list of to-dos throughout the day. Right? And that often these things, for example, during feeding time, it's often structured that it's not that, you know, you feed the children when they're hungry, you feed the children when the food is here. And then you have, you know, something like, Here's 30 minutes or 45 minutes in which not just one child, but the children in the entire ward has to eat. And then, you know, someone comes and cleans up the food. So under these circumstances, feeding is some um, researchers often describe them as kind of this assembly line process, right? It's the process in which you just have to quickly hurry through. So given that backdrop, a moment like this, um, is particularly striking, which is why my friend Kelly kind of saw it on her phone and said, you got to see this. And one, one of the things I wanted to just to give us a chance, um, you know how um, when, uh, I know we, many of us probably haven't had a chance to watch many sports games um, since COVID, but uh, typically when you watch, you know, almost whatever sports game, when there's a great play, right, they'll do an instant replay and they'll, they'll go back in and look in detail at, you know, what the quarterback did or, or, or you know, how, how, how someone is swinging the bat. I always feel like when it comes to the work with children, like we need to honor that with an instant replay, right, so that we can really appreciate uh, what is happening in these moments. So I'm going to just, I'm, I want to take two of the comments that came in earlier um, through the chat window particularly about the shoulder, um, the shoulder shrugging, which many of you noticed, right? And, um, and, and, and one, one thing that I'd like you to just have a chance to look at is, is what is the dynamic of the shoulder shrugging, right? Like, like what's the order in which it's happening, right? And, and the first time I just saw them and I go, oh, they mirror each other, great. But like, who's mirroring who, right? Who's trying to communicate what? So what I did here is um, I am going to go back to the video real quick. All right. So what I did here is uh, I slowed down the video to about half the speed so that, and, and I took away the sound so that then we can just like take back and what for, for this part, if what, what we, we can do is just um, take a look at this pair, this dyad on the left-hand side of the screen. So right here on the left-hand side of the screen, right? And, and, and focus the attention on what's happening in the shoulder, whether it's the shoulder coming from the baby or the shoulder coming from the grown-up, right? Just that little detail. See if we notice something more or someone earlier was asking, what's the prompt? I think the prompt here is, just see what you notice about the dynamics of what is happening between the shoulders of this baby and this caregiver. So 
Let's try that again. Um, anything that you noticed during the slow motion replay that added to your noticing that, that, that you had just a while ago? I'm gonna just watch the chat window for a second here. Ruth Ann says she's following the baby. He did it first, right? I didn't see, see that I, when I was, you know, a few years ago, I only saw that after I slowed down the video. That's right, that's right. These is start to, I mean, we really get into the heart of reciprocity, right? That he starts and then she does something and then, actually, I'm sorry, I'm not sure he or she, but the baby starts and then she does, the caregiver does it and the baby does it again. And all of that, right? So we can count back and forth twice, right? Or just at least four different attempts of communication just with the shoulder alone. And all of that happening in 10 seconds while everything else is happening. The feeding, the spoon, she blew on the food. Yes, Di Diana was saying that she's blowing on the food to make sure it's not too hot. And, and, you know, and he's trusting her when the food is coming and all of that. But in the middle of all of, of, all of that, we have the shoulders communicating. And the shoulder part to me, is the most surprising, but also the beautiful part of, of this particular interaction, right? Because in theory, right, shoulder isn't particularly related to eating, right? I mean, most of us don't eat and shrug our shoulders at the same time, but somehow the child feels, it feels like, like to me, like the child is saying, yes, I like to eat. I like to be in this moment with you, but I want something else while we're doing that as well. And, and the caregiver is just so present, right? That she's focused on the temperature of the food, how much food to pile onto the spoon, because it's not her choice, right? She has to finish feeding but by the rules and regulations of the institution. But in the midst of that, she's attending, she's present, right, to what is happening. And I know that um, in, uh, after I have been invited um, to uh, speak with this conference, I was fretting about, I don't know enough about IRE or Magda Gruber's work. Uh, Ruth Ann had sent me this book. So I have been reading that book. And of course I've gone on YouTube to watch old videos of uh, Gruber's talks and so on. And um, one of the things I, I caught um, in Gerber's uh, uh, writing in 1980s, you know, contrasting what she called traditional caregiving and, and edu um, care. And uh, she talked, for example, about, um, where's a, a care, you know, a traditional caregiver may rush through these routine caregiving activities in order to get ready for something else. And in the orphanage, that's certainly the case, right? They're supposed to rush through. The next thing is you gotta change the diapers. The next thing is all the babies have to go for a nap all at the same time, right? The educator uses the time that must be spent, right? You have to change the child's diaper. You have to feed the child. Use the time that must be spent um, as a potential source for a valued learning experience or a relational experience. So in that sense, right? So here's a Chinese caregiver working in the difficult circumstances of an orphanage and nevertheless is embodying kind of these educaring principles. And we've, in the work that we have done around the world in these different settings, I think these moments are there all the time. If we just looked, if we we're able to quiet ourselves down and sit back instead of evaluating, judging, just sit back and appreciate. And we're able to see these moments in some of the most difficult contexts in which uh, for, for, for both children and the grownups. And the first lesson that comes out of that is this idea that the power, right? The enormous power of human relationships comes from the most simple, most ordinary moments. Um, it comes in the diaper change in the orphanage. It comes in these tiny little moments of feeding and exchanges. And it comes from these moments that we often take for granted and administrators and orphanages may just completely overlook. And that when my friend Kelly or, or any of our colleagues replay a moment like that for the people who work there, initially their first reaction was always surprise. They were surprised 
to see themselves in these simple ordinary moments. But then right after the surprise, they are reminded of how incredibly important the tiny little things they do day in and day out, even when they're not afforded the time, the respect and the resources to do what they like to do with children. And it is in these moments, right, that we see the connections between how human relationships in these tiny little interactions contribute to broader human development. And that what we see in moments like this is that a child, right, finding a way, not always through words, but finding a way to express a need for development, right? So in this particular case, you have the child that says, I'm hungry, I want to eat. Yes, I have that need, but I also have some other need and I'm gonna communicate through my shoulders. And so children finding a way to communicate what they need and then the caregiver just being present enough, right? They're able to kind of release their human capacity um, to provide an experience that matches what the child needs. And in this case, it might be as simple as you shrugged your shoulders, I'm gonna shrug my shoulder as well, right? In the middle of everything. And you shrug your shoulder again, I'm gonna to try to do that with my shoulder, with my face. I'm just gonna to try to match you, to tell you that, hey, I see you. I know what you're looking for, right? And every time, however small the moment is, every time these two little things get together, right? the expression of the need and the capacity to provide a matching experience. There we have an interaction that has a developmental impact that provides something, even if it's tiny incremental step, it just provides something to propel the person's development. And that across all these settings, what we find is what we know in our common sense experiences, what most helpers and perhaps every educators understand in the context of their work that it's the simplest, ordinary, everyday interactions that are the basic building blocks of the kind of human relationships that help children develop or what we call developmental relationships. And we observe these moments in all sorts of settings. And the second story that I wanted to share uh, with all of you um, comes from about seven or eight uh, uh, years ago, we started um, in Pittsburgh and um, in the urban neighborhoods of Pittsburgh, often these are places uh, that we call, even though they have a lot of families, but we have a bit of a childcare desert, right? There are no large childcare centers. Uh, there, there aren't enough large childcare centers in these communities. And often what we have are these really small family childcare or home-based childcare um, in these kind of environments. And um, these often are low-income communities and many of the families afford childcare um, using subsidies or have to be on wait list for the um, childcare subsidies uh, from the state. So um, we started to work with some of the family childcare providers, not to evaluate them, but again, to go in there just to experience what life is like day in and day out inside a little family child care center and to appreciate what happens even in the tiniest small houses uh, in these communities. And I wanted to share with you one of the most interesting, heartwarming uh, uh, and odd moments that we encountered uh, in, in, in the child care center. So the way we typically do is we would arrive around nine o'clock in, in the morning after all the children have been dropped off. And we would try to make ourselves as invisible as we can by sitting in a corner of the room and just not move and not do anything. Um, and then, you know, our eyeballs and our cameras on trying to capture what we see. Well, so in this particular uh, child care, family child care center, I noticed that around 10 o'clock um, that there's this little girl, she, she's just over two and um, she, was, she was pretty happy. I mean, she was just this cute, beautiful, happy little girl. And then around 10 o'clock at snack time, she suddenly become very subdued, right? And then they tried, uh, the, the, the caregiver tried to comfort her and then, you know, she, she gets excited again, she starts to do arts and stuff, but by lunchtime, she suddenly becomes subdued again. And, and then as she starts to eat, like, you know, she gets teary eyed and she starts to call for her mom, mama. And uh, what we find out later 
uh, by interviewing the um, the uh, 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 owner of the the family childcare was that this was her th third day in family childcare. Like she has never been in out of home care. She was always either cared by her mother or her grandmother. And then her grandmother got sick um, during that time. And her mother uh, went from a night shift in the hospital to a day shift. And so all of a sudden there isn't a care option. And then at last minute, her mother was able to find this particular child care, uh, family child care center on the way to work so that she can drop off the child. Anyway, that's the backdrop. So anyhow, um, around uh, 1230, um, the other three children know the routine. They, they, they go to their little cots and they are, you know, they're there um, kind of quiet. And then this child, you know, is really getting anxious, right? So anyway, we have been sitting in the corner of the room, not moving for most of the, this time. So the camera is on. I just want to show you kind of what happens in that moment. The caregiver just poked her head out of the door, grabbed her mail, she came back in, and that's the moment that you are about to see. Oops, sorry. The sun is sucking you, it's cold out there. Mommy. Mommy. Yeah, mommy's at work. Mommy. Yeah, come on, come on, just sit down with me. Let's do the mail, come on. Come on, see that book, Harriet Carter. Fresh finds. I never got that one before. I don't know if I want to look in that one because they might get me. Published Carolyn House. They're always telling you you want something. And that's worth the four. Rush processed four. Huh. Let's open that and see what that is. It tells you it says fold along perforation and remove. Let's see. Oh, would you hold that for me? Thank you. Hold that one for me too. Thank you. What do you think is inside here? You know what's inside here? I know I don't. Another Visa card, TakeCreditOne.com. Preferred customer, pre-approved for up to fifteen hundred dollars. That's why we have pre-approved you for a platinum Visa card with a starting credit line up to fifteen hundred plus. This offer has no enrollment fee and no over limit fees, and well, that will award you. Efforts would automatic reviews of your account for credit line increases. Yes, you. We want you to zero own. fraud liability if your car is even lost or stolen. Do you know what any of that means? I don't think you know what any of that means. It sounds good though. Three easy ways to accept your credit. Let's think of something to do while we're waiting, while we're waiting for something new to do. So um, I'd like, love to try this again. Um, I know there's a lot happening in this little moment and um, um, I'd love to hear uh, just in the chat, window, you know, any little details 
that 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 you notice. You don't have to narrate the entire um, um, scene, um, but but I'm I'm curious to see um, what is it that that you're seeing. So someone notice the caregiver smiling when the child's falling asleep. I see uh, Debbie is concerned that, that, that the caregiver may be trying too much to distract the child from her feelings. And then someone else saw the distraction could be something that seems very much like something that actually would happen at home in the normal part of caregiving. Um, Linda noticed that the caregiver involved the child by handing her just pieces of paper. And Ruthanne was talking about how she's addressing this issue, whatever the child is struggling with, kind of sideways. That's an interesting way to put it. The reading is very boring. Yes, absolutely. Um, and Marsha was saying that the caregiver is including the little girl in her daily routine and asking for her help and thereby eliciting the helper in the child. Wow, okay. Early literacy activity. Heather was saying, giving her a chance to hear her voice, the caregiver's voice continuously without trying to engage her too much so that she can relax and rest. Seems like they really enjoy being with each other, Joe writes. Now, one thing that's important to remember is the two of them barely knew each other, right? So this was the third day. Um, of caregiving, they seem to be able to build a trust. And the child seemed to settle into the body, gradually just settling into the body. Right. And Axel writes, you know, within IRE uh, a framework, we may, you know, try to validate the feelings before moving on, right? And Mary Jane said, I'll be cautious about suggesting she's distracting the child from her feelings. Consider what she relays through her comforting touch. She's holding her feelings somatically. That's right. The importance of, Chris, right? The importance of boring, non-threatening presence. Oh boy, that's great. Okay, um, I'd love to, you know, had we been in person, this is the time like we would love to just hear from, you know, all these different perspectives across the room. And um, what I wanted to show this, not to say there's only one way to see this, right? So as you can see in the chat window, there's, I mean, everyone's noticing different details and everyone have a slightly different take, right? About different aspects of this moment, uh, whether it's a distraction, whether it's an acknowledgement physically and 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 um, all of us couldn't help thinking like what would we do in that situation would we do some things differently would we do something the same and um, what I think I wanted to share at this moment to point out is that none of us know right we haven't been in the life of that particular caregiver and that particular child and um, what we can do, however, um, is to appreciate what we can see, right? No moment of interaction between anybody um, is going to be perfect. Certainly not perfect by anyone else's perspective. But what we like to think about within that moment is what are the needs that the child may be expressing, even without words or with just one word, mama, and what is within that adult's capacity that the adult is providing? The adult may not be providing everything, but what is the adult providing? And could that be enough, right, for the moment? It's the difference between a perfect moment and a moment that may be good enough, at least for what is needed in that particular, in the here and now of that particular moment. So just to wrap this particular story up, um, we continue to work in the same neighborhood. So the following week, uh, we ran into um, Mr. Vore, that's her name. Uh, we ran into her um, in the workshop and we said, oh, how's you know, the little girl 
doing because it was such an interesting moment and she said oh she's fine like she 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 settled into her environment and so on and so I asked her you know can we come back and see so she yeah she said come back anytime so the next day we took our camera and we hung out with uh, her group uh, for the morning again and I just wanted to show you just a tiny glimpse uh, the week after um, in that um, child care center because we waited until about 12 30 again now she's to the point where once she's done with lunch, she gets wiped off and she runs and gets on her bed. It was just such a natural thing to me to, to do what I did. I didn't even realize what I was doing, really. I just thought I was comforting her, you know, making her feel safe and secure here. And Anyway, um, I just wanted, one, to wrap up that story and at we interviewed Ms. DeVore afterwards, just trying to get her voice, her reflection about these moments. And as I watched it over the years, I'm struck by one of the last things she said. I don't know if you heard her at the end. She said, you know, I, I was just doing, you know, what I do and, and I, I didn't even know what I was doing. Um, in fact, we hear that a lot um, from people who teach and who work with young children. Um, they have this natural capacity, but, but somehow through, you know, the various processes of professional development or whatever it is, somehow they haven't been afforded the opportunity to recognize, I think, the beauty in some of the things that they do day in and day out, even in the most ordinary kind of moments. And what we learn from moments like this, what we learn from people like this, is this idea that when it comes to human relationships, having at least one person right, um, just matters. Having just at least one matters. Right? Even in that moment, you can imagine this wasn't a, you know, a care provider the child was deeply familiar with, have already established trust. This was a third day. The care provider is practically a stranger. But in that moment, right, the child misses mom, misses grandma, the child find it odd having to go to nap in this strange place, but having that at least one person matter. And that in that moment, she, the care provider, didn't have to be perfect to be helpful. And that is true for so many of us, particularly when I think about the physical distancing that all of us are living through. Right? Not only for children, for grown-ups, for the elderly in nursing homes, and so on. For my children's grandma, who we haven't been able to see um, since January. And this idea that while we couldn't do everything, that we couldn't be where we needed to be or where we wanted to be, just to trust that having at least one person right, um, matters. Having at least one person we can connect with, even if we're connecting over Zoom or on a telephone, that somehow matters. And this is something that, of course, in the research science, we've been talking about this for decades, right? So in the science of resilience, uh, essentially our, uh, our human capacity to withstand and bounce back even after adver adversity. Um, the Harvard Center on the Developing Child review, you know, the research of resilience from across cultures and age groups and, and, and they draw what many others have drawn in the past, which is that the single most common finding from these research studies about resilience is that children who end up doing well, despite early adversity, have had at least one stable and committed relationship with a supportive parent, a caregiver, or other adults. Does that mean having at least one is enough? I would imagine that that is a difficult question. Right? I think for each person who is a helper, for each person who is a caregiver, who is an educator, um, what we can do is to be that at least one. But we can't always be sure, and we can't always know that whether that child having at least one is enough. In fact, I think educators, care providers, so on, often get the message that it's not enough. Um, in the context of early childhood um, caregiving and quality standards, for example, um, if we were to judge 
the moment we just saw, right? Using the traditional measures and standards about early childhood quality, we might recognize some of the beauty in that moment, but a trained assessor would very easily recognize the other things. For example, some assessors watch this video would tell me, you know, having the fish food there uh, at that particular height, we would have docked a couple points, right, for health and safety regulations, and that across the systems, uh, if a caregiver like that doesn't have the right credentials that can go on her walls, then she gets rated a little lower, right, in terms of the system that we think of as, um, a, as quality care. There are also others who may say that, well, look, you know, the material she's using is not developmentally appropriate. You know, junk mail is not something that we would consider developmentally appropriate for the child. That's true, right? I don't think anybody would claim that junk mail is developmentally appropriate. Um, but in that moment, though, in that moment, though, I wonder if it can be argued that she is making developmentally appropriate use of a piece of material that is not developmentally appropriate. That as boring as the material is, that would be exactly the point of that particular moment. And I remember times when my children were young and I had to work and I had to put them to sleep. And so I would read aloud my research papers. Um, it's awfully boring. Sometimes they fall asleep first and sometimes I fall asleep first reading these same papers. But when we think about these challenges of really understanding what's at the heart of the quality, um, we think I, I, it often reminded me of something that has been attributed to Albert Einstein, which is this idea that what counts cannot always be counted and that what can be counted does not always count. And that it calls all of us, whether we are researchers, whether we are trainers, consultants, teachers, parents alike, to have a sense of humility when we're looking at someone else's caregiving and to have a sense of acceptance when we're looking at our own caregiving. That it's a continuous process to figure out what are the things that are very easily counted, you know, the diploma on the wall or the adherence or violations of a particular code or line of a standard, but also to be open enough to always look for what really counts in a moment like this. And that when we look at the juxtapositions of the system in which we have used to define and codify and score quality, and then we look at the lived experiences of people who educate, who care for children, and it requires us to not take kind of this either or position, but to understand between these two worlds, there are, there are an opportunity. There are opportunities um, for us to really think about and really understand what counts in the life of a child in the life of that particular moment. And in our work, what we have found that what seemed to really count as you go from setting to setting to setting to setting is this idea that ultimately, right, all the materials that you have, whether they're developmentally appropriate or inappropriate, all the beautiful spaces that you have, all the beautiful degrees and credentials that we have, ultimately these things ought to come together and ought to support what happens between people, between people across all these different settings, whether you are in a rural community, whether you're serving infants, whether you're serving children with disabilities. And for us, these things come down to some of the very same principles or the ideas that I read in um, this wonderful book <laughs> that has been shared with me as well as uh, a lot of Gerber's work. Uh, you may call it by a different name, but that in the end, right, these are the different aspect elements of human interactions, a sense of connection, a sense of reciprocity, a sense of inclusion, not just for children with disabilities, but for children of different abilities, temperaments, for children who happen to be in a good mood or a bad mood, whatever they are. And of course, connected with them all is an opportunity to grow, not just grow in their physical 
abilities or cognitive abilities, but also grow in their, uh, in their capacity to understand how they feel, to be able to regulate how they feel, and to be able to borrow the strength from the people and the bodies that are near you so that they can eventually develop the capacity to support themselves. For any of you who are interested, uh, my colleagues and I, we put up a lot of this work and some of the tools that's associated at this website called Simple Interactions simpleinteraction.org. It's a completely free public domain resource. And over time, we try to add more to it just to share with everyone um, just about how do we go about looking for these things. But what that takes us to is to think about what it is that we all could do right, to support the kind of things that really, really count when it happens between the caregivers, the educators, and the children, as well as the families. And in that, I think in our work, we gradually find this to be true, which is that any practice, any program or model or policy, they can help children learn and grow if and only if it encourages, enriches, and empowers the human relationships these tiny little simple ordinary interactions around the child, that these are the things that comes together, right? That as great as our practice guidelines are, as famous as our program models are, as well-intentioned as some of our policies are, that if we can do that, we're helping children grow. And if somehow, right, the kind of well-intentioned practices and programs and policy we put in place doesn't support and strengthen the human relationships, then it's unlikely that it is gonna be fruitful. And the way we have thought about that, um, trying to make sense of it, I think has gone back to this concept that we have um, in the research community within the last two decades or so of describing human relationship as the active ingredient of um, the environment's influence on healthy human development, whether that human being is a baby or whether that human being is an adolescent or even when that human being is an elderly person in a residential facility. And by that, I think what it means to me is not that human relationship is all you need, but that everything else that we have has to work through the quality of these human relationships. And if you would forgive me, let me just offer a kind of a silly analogy for this. So when my children were young, uh, one of my caregiving routines was that I was to supervise them, uh, brush their teeth uh, at night. And I am the opposite of the uh, edu carers <laughs> that I described earlier, because I'm always distracted and unfocused. And I always find supervising my children brushing their teeth to be one of the most boring things that you can do, because, you know, I like to talk to my kids. And of course, when they brush their teeth, they're not supposed to talk. So anyhow, um, I remember, you know, at the time I was a researcher, I haven't had much experience in early childhood. Um, and I was, I, I just wanted to read something while they're brushing their teeth, there was nothing to read in the bathroom, in their bathroom, except the back of the toothpaste. So I started to read the back of the toothpaste. And I encourage all of you, if you're curious, go back and uh, find a box of to toothpaste and read it. But I noticed uh, that in the back of the toothpaste, there's these two boxes, you know, and one of the box says uh, active ingredient, and the other box says inactive ingredient. And the active ingredient behind it, almost all kind of uh, FDA approved toothpaste is some form of fluoride. And the inactive ingredients are things that most of which I cannot pronounce. Unless you're a chemical engineer, I don't think uh, you actually know kind of what they actually do. Anyhow, I thought that, okay, fluoride prevents cavity. I get that part. Um, what's all these inactive ingredients for? I don't know. Um, but what in that silly moment, what it reminded me was I was thinking, okay, uh, what if our work with children, right? Babies, adolescents, anywhere, in the classroom, in community, in childcare. What if it's like a tube of toothpaste, right? And we have to label an active ingredient. Like we have to find the fluoride of our work with 
children's development. And at the time, I didn't have a clear answer, but as I worked more and more and more with the helpers and the caregivers and educators, it seemed really clear that if you were to ask an educator and a caregiver, they would say, no, it's, it's about our relationships. So the fluoride equivalent right, of our work with children are these relationships. Then how do we understand everything else, right? How do we understand curriculum? How do we understand the buildings? How, how do we understand all the credentials that we have, right? It's not that they're not useful, um, so the analogy goes like, it's the only thing I understand about inactive ingredients in the toothpaste are like flavor. So my children were in pretty insistent that they didn't want the grown up mint flavor. It, it was awful to them. They wanted a bubble gum flavor in the toothpaste. So when you think about something like flavor, right? So flavoring doesn't prevent cavity, but what it does is that it helps young children hold the toothpaste in their mouth for two minutes or three minutes and then the fluoride had a chance to work. So the way we think about the relationship between flavor and fluoride is that they both are needed. They both are needed. You're not gonna throw out one or the other. But what happens is that the flavor is useful if and only if it helps the fluoride to do its work. Right? Imagine you had a tube of toothpaste, the fluoride is out of there. You can have all the flavor you want. It doesn't do anything. Right? So. That's how we start to think about human relationships in the context of child development. That this is the fluoride, that everything else we do has to help the fluoride do its work. And if it doesn't, then it's not particularly helpful. And that's how we eventually arrived at this idea that the practices and programs and policies that we do, they can help children learn and grow if and only if it encourages, enriches, and empowers the human relationship, the fluoride of human development around the child. And that leads to the last of the lessons that we have learned, having observed, and most importantly, having listened uh, to helpers across all these different settings. And that has to do with this idea of help the helpers or help the educators all around us. When we think about what it takes for children to grow up healthy and strong and resilient, no matter where they are in the world, we think about what does that children need day in and day out, right? And clearly they need the interactions, right? Both solitude and interactions with caregivers in their families. And of course, many children rely on helpers outside their families as well. Early childhood educators or early intervention teams, home visitors, family support, pediatricians, social work, whoever they are, right? There are all these adults that the children look to outside. And it goes almost without saying that if children need both of these kinds of interactions, that it would be great if the relationship can, a partnership can exist between all the people who are invested in the child's life. But that whether you are a family or whether you're a helper to the family and to the child, none of us are alone, right? None of us can do this alone. And one of the hardest things during COVID is that we're physically distanced from so many other people. And so often, particularly parents, but often teachers do, they have to do it. They feel like they have to do it by themselves. My colleagues, uh, Noni LaSalle and Stephanie Jones at the graduate school um, like to say that what it means to help the helpers is for all of us collectively to be as invested in the helpers as they are in our children, because whether you go by common sense or whether you go by decades of research, what is clear is that we cannot make a lasting impact on children by skipping over the adults in the middle. I understand the opening keynote for this conference is very much about that message as well. But how do we do that? How do we do that well how do we develop a set of principles um, to do for the helpers um, what we imagine right, the best helpers are doing for children and for families? And in the process of uh, trying to learn very quickly about RIE's work, and of course, learning about Gerber's legacy, is that I find that there's the fundamental principles within the IRE work align so closely to what I believe about helpers, but also align so closely with what is it that we can do for the helpers. 
for example, right, within EduCare, I know for all of you, I mean, your work embodies this, that the work starts with respect, right? And demonstrating that respect in everyday interactions with a child, it's about attending to, appreciating and noticing somebody and to listen to them, to really look, and then to trust in someone's competency and to guide our work and our respect through observations. And I can imagine that any of these principles, all we have to do is to change the word from child, infant, to educarers. And I can imagine any of these things not applying in parallel to the work that we do um, for grownups, for each other within the community. That respect is the basis of our work and that we don't just talk about respect, we demonstrate it with all the times that we have to interact with them. That we would help an educator, whether a teacher or a parent to feel secure, to feel appreciated, to feel that somebody else is deeply, truly interested in the way they do, by the way we look, by the way we listen, and of course, to ultimately trust in the educator's competence, in their capacity, and to observe before we judge, to appreciate before we criticize. And these are the principles that RIE has practiced with young children for so many years. And as I read through them in my mind, I just, the words start to exchange themselves to the grownups. And this is a beautiful framework for working with grownups. And so when we think about the educators, we think about the helpers in children's lives, we can think about that if every family needs to be embedded in a community of support around them. These are other families as well as other professionals who are there to support the family. And in the same way, the professionals need to be surrounded by a community of practice, a group of people who share their practice, who share the mission, the passion of their practice so that they can be supported with each other. And that, of course, that is not different than wanting a community to be around children, the toddlers with infants, toddlers with toddlers, infants with infants, and that we've always valued this community of peers. And that these things together, right, is this parallel ecosystem where everyone is in relationship with one another and everyone is in community with one another. And so as we think through the work that we have done with helpers, with educators around the world, around all these different settings, around the places um, that sometimes are particularly difficult um, to focus on these relational care. These are the lessons that we have drawn by observing, by noticing, by listening to all of them in terms of how they see their work. Um, as I was reading the educator work and Gerber's ideas, I start to understand that we have been trying to do with grownups what RIE have been trying to do with infants and toddlers. And that these lessons are that the power of our human connections with each other comes from the most simple, ordinary moments of our day. And that to be resilient against uncertainty and adversity, particularly in a time like now, having even one human connection matters. It doesn't mean that that's enough, but it does mean that each of us matter in that context. And that in order to be enough, that all of us has to be in community with one another. Because just like children, we learn and grow best by doing things, by doing things on our own, by doing things together with each other, with children and with families. And so what that leads us to is that no matter what kind of work we do, whether we are parents, whether we're educators, um, and whether we are those who support the parents and support the educators, I think there's an essential question that comes with anything that we do, regardless of our job titles, and regardless of our spheres of influence, which is that how does this thing that we're doing, whatever it is, a practice, a program, a policy, how does this thing that we're doing 
help to encourage, enrich, and empower the human connections and communities around children and around their helpers. And when we try to answer that question, and when, when, when we think about how all of you might approach that question, we picture kind of this, this scene, right? So if you imagine a pond when, when rain just started to fall, and then you, know, you start to see these tiny little ripples, right? And they just come down to different parts of the pond. And no matter how small the raindrop, it creates this ripple. And this ripple just grows and grows and grows. And pretty soon, all these ripples intersect with each other. And with enough ripples, you actually have a current. You actually have a movement. And that's how sometimes how we think about um, what is it that we can do to encourage, in, enrich, and empower the human relationships. That each of us, no matter where we are, right, is the center of a small ripple, regardless of what our roles are. And by attending just to the human connections and communities right around us, that ripple grows. And that eventually all of us continue to learn and grow within this context of relationships. And so, at the end, I just wanted to share um, this question with all of you. It's certainly been so important to us um, as we try to observe, understand, and support helpers all around the world. And I imagine that this question um, can be and have been quite important in all the work that you're doing. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. I know we have quite a few questions. Um, so if we can go ahead and stop share, actually you can leave that up for a moment. Okay, that's fine too. We can stop sharing and then um, take some time for Q and A. Um, that was really powerful. Um, and I know that the chat was going, lots of discussion, uh, so many different pieces that you brought forth for people. And so let's just dive into the Q&A portion. First question is, can you speak to how we can advocate to protect our teachers in whatever setting so that they are not pressured by the increasing number of assessment measures that they are expected to use, many of which are rigid and formulaic? How do we protect and preserve the essential simple interactions that you and your colleagues so beautifully articulate? I think that's one of the most challenging um, advocacy, right? It's one thing to advocate um, for more money and, and, and so on, but, it's, it's, it, but prior to even being able to do that, we have to advocate for an understanding and appreciation, right? Um, the only thing I can say, I don't have the answer, but I wanted to share with you things that give me hope. Um, the hope is that there's something so fundamental about human interactions that I find that as we travel kind of around the world, and as many of you just experienced, like you can see a human interaction, even if it's 10 seconds long, you feel something inside you, right? And so what we have found is that um, for years we worked with teachers and, and, and care providers. And it goes without saying, you know, when you show a video like that, teachers and caregivers and parents, they just feel it. They, they notice things. And I was always really nervous, right? When we have to talk to uh, policymakers, administrators, like legislators and so on. Last year, I think we made a presentation to like seven governors and 12 lieutenant go governors. And we're so nervous. We're like, I don't know, how, how, do, how can we help them to appreciate the grownups? And, and what ended up happening was that when we show these moments, right? When, when we show these moments, even to people who are, who are not anywhere near the profession, they feel something too. And, and, and I think there's something about human interactions that's at the core of what it means to be a human being. And, and that what has given me so much hope is that whether we talk to state officials, federal officials, elected officials, um, physicians who haven't thought much about <laughs> supporting parent-child interactions. Anyone, I think, in their own experiences understand what it means to have a beautiful interaction. And if, if only we can help them to see it, either by bringing them into our preschools or bring the preschools to them, but whatever it is that we can do, I think we can start to build this common understanding. And um, uh, my 
favorite role model is Mr. Rogers. And uh, one of the things he loved to say, uh, even when he talks to grownups, is that he would like to start by saying, you were a child once. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I think there's something about that in us that help us to recognize. But even beyond that, many people that we speak with, you, you are a parent once and still. You are a grandparent once and still. And there's something about these beautiful interactions that can resonate. And maybe if we start there, we can start to advocate for compensation. We can advocate for more systemic support for all the educators out there. Thank you. What does the research, our next question is, what does the research say about the duration of time that the just one relationship needs to last? Are there any boundaries around that? I think the accurate answer is research is not short. <laughs> but what again gives me reasons for hope is that there are ample research studies that have shown that even brief moments matter. So there's a difference between saying brief moments matter and brief moments is enough, right? So I would never say that, well, a child, all they need is five minutes of good interactions and they're gonna be fine. That wouldn't be true. But on the other hand, if you look at a person like, a, a, think, of, think of a parent that works two or three jobs who gets only 20 minutes of quality time during a day or even 10 minutes of quality time, how would we ever be able to say to that parents, hey, your 10 minutes isn't enough and is never going to be enough. I think the message to the parents, whether we rely on science or common sense is that if 10 minutes all you, is all you have during the week when you're working all these jobs, your 10 minutes matters. And that we have ample studies that can show in the preschool environment, right? For children who are under severe stress or behaviorally challenged, um, studies have shown that just give them two 15 minute one-on-one -on -one time with their teachers, right? Following very simple, almost educating like protocols when the teachers lay back a little bit and follow the child lead. Just two 15 minute gaps helps that child to reduce their stress to a level that you can measure by just measuring the cortisol levels in their saliva at the end of that period, right? I mean, there are studies like that over and over again, not just with babies, but with adolescents, with high school students. So while there's no definitive answer that says you need this many minutes, what is clear to me is that every minute count and, and that the message that comes from all of us to those who are struggling to find the time is that the time you can find matters. Thank you. Uh, we have a question. Uh, do you teach any publicly accessible workshops or courses? <laughs> or are you mainly teaching through the university? So um, we try to uh, share many of our tools and recordings on the Simple Interactions website. It's just www.simpleinteractions.org. It is a non-commercial public domain, completely free resource. So a number of our talks and webinars and the Simple Interactions tool that we use to observe and how to use the tool, all these things are available. And if you sign up for the Simple Interactions newsletter on the website, any new activities would come out. Uh, we're gonna run a virtual institute free, completely free. Uh, I think in January or February, we were hoping to do something like that. And then through uh, Harvard, uh, in addition to the courses, we also have um, professional development institutes that comes out uh, in these different settings. But I, on the other hand, I'm really wary um, of adding something more to everything that everyone is doing. I, I, I truly believe that the, the model that IRE have and the principles here are beautiful. Um, as I read all these things, I find them so connected with us, um, not only in terms of how to see children, but how to see grownups, how to support grownups. And I just imagine that all of you, if you have a chance to gather together in communities, whether in a conference like this or in smaller communities of a few people, just within your reflection, within your reflective pra practices, you can learn so much 
uh, from each other. I think what I miss the most about doing things virtually as opposed to in person is I don't feel like I have enough opportunities to learn from all of you. And I'm just so excited to see all these comments in the chat window that I couldn't read while I'm presenting. So I'm gonna save them all so I can go back and read them all. Yeah. Um, how open are the organizations that you're working with to develop quality standards to what you were, how open are the organizations to what you were saying about the central role of relationships in developing quality care? What is surprising to us is that policy makers and administrators from state level all the way to federal level has been open. I just, you know, prior to interacting with them, I always picture in my head, you know, this unfair stereotype of policymakers and I always feel like they don't understand. But over time, I find that there's so much more resonance than I ever expected, in part because you'd be surprised to know how many um, administrators at state levels and federal levels have been teachers once and uh, have, have been educators on, on the ground. I know that, for example, I talked particularly about family child care and uh, we gave you know, our presentations and speeches two years ago to the federal government when they brought all the state and administrators together. And a year later, um, the Federal um, Administration for Children and Families released a request for proposal for researchers to submit proposals to redefine standards for family child care, recognizing that the kind of standards that apply for the system may not apply to these tiny little intimate settings. And, um, a while ago, the state of Kansas reached out to us because they were one of the states that haven't developed a statewide quality standards. And um, they wanted to develop the quality rating and improvement systems, but they decided to change not only a word, but the principle of the system. So the quality rating system is called rating, the, the letter R. So in Kansas, they said, we're gonna develop a system called quality recognition <laughs> and improvement system. They wanted to start by appreciating and recognizing the qualities. So often we find these affirmations coming from surprising places, from surprising people. It doesn't mean that the system as it exists now conveys a true sense of recognition and affirmation and respect to all the educators out there, but I feel hopeful that if we all continue to have this collective voice to advocate for this entire field, particularly for the grownups in the field, I think the system can gradually tilt, 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 and change um, in the direction that is respectful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think we have just a few more questions. Um, Dr. Lee, is the longer video with the interview of the mother and teacher still available on the Fred Rogers website? So I guess somebody had seen the, uh, the video. At some that's other right, that's time. right. Let me, if you don't mind waiting just for one second, let me just see um, if it is possible for us to find it. Um, so for for those of you who haven't seen the video, I just wanted to let you know, there's this really sweet story. Um, when we uh, went back to interview um, the caregiver, um, as well as the parent, we find out that when the parent dropped off the little girl, uh, she realized that when she was a child, she was cared by the same family child care provider. It was a different house, but, but, but she had grown up there. So I found the video and I'm going to put the link in the chat. Excellent. There we go. Um, and um, it's a seven minute long. We interviewed the caregiver as well as um, um, the mom. And, and it, was just, it was just really sweet to see three generations in one place um, and, and, and what caregiving means, right? Uh, amongst all of them. Great, thank you. Thank you for that. So that is in the chat. We also um, had a question just about the chat. Uh, we can save this and post it when we post our recording, because I know it went a little fast and there was a lot of discussion and um, I will definitely share it with our presenter as well. Do we have any last questions? Um, if anybody wants to put anything in the Q&A, I think we have time for maybe one more. 
I know there's a lot of discussion happening in the in the chat and a lot of thank yous to you for the presentation. Some great comments in here. Um, really appreciating uh, the resources that you're providing um, at Simple Interactions and also um, this presentation and how inspirational and um, positive and hopeful this has been. I really appreciate it. And I know our attendees do as well. Uh, if we don't have any other questions, I'm gonna go ahead and close us out. Let's see any Thank you so comments? much. Nope, I think we're... Um, oh, there's it's one last thing, sorry. Um, what is the Fred Rogers Center that was pictured in the slides? Somebody's ah. not familiar with that. Yeah, so, so thank you for, for asking. Um, so I'm assuming you, uh, so uh, let me start. Mr. Rogers, <laughs> so um, um, public television starting from the 1950s all the way to the early 2000s, he had the longest running children's program. And uh, his full name is Fred Rogers. And uh, Fred was from Pittsburgh and I went to graduate school in Pittsburgh. So I ended up working with Fred's organization and I was the director of the Fred Rogers Center. Um, uh, and the Fred Rogers Center was established after Fred retired from television in 2001. And the goal is to leave television and then continue to support children's helpers all around the country, all around the world. And that's how the Fred Rogers Center was established. And the Fred uh, uh, Rogers Center continues to grow, continues to do this kind of work. Um, feel free to just Google Fred Rogers Center and you'll find, find them. But in the context for this particular work, um, the Fred Roger Center is the biggest, one of the, uh, the biggest partner in the Simple Interactions work. Uh, my really good colleague and partner, Dr. Dana Winters, some of you, you might have seen her in California and other places. Um, she leads the Simple Interactions effort uh, all across early childcare settings and child welfare settings all across the uh, 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 United States. And so, there's a ton of resources and ideas from Fred uh, uh, Rogers Center as well. They have developed a beautiful kind of uh, what do families and educators do during COVID um, section for the website. So I would encourage all of you to check them out. Um, and uh, we, uh, Harvard uh, uh, Graduate School of Edu Education and Fred uh, uh, Rogers Center are in close collaborations uh, when it comes to this work of uh, advocating for the for respecting and empowering human relationships. So thank you for the question. Thank you. And thank you so much. We appreciate you have truly, truly um, graced us as this is our closing presentation for our conference. And I just wanna say our appreciation again and appreciation to all of our, I'm pointing to our attendees as if we were in real life, to all of our attendees. And thank you everybody for um, spending your time with us and spending your time with us this weekend. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to learn. <laughs> <laughs>